Hello and welcome to Rise of the Data Cloud. Today's episode features an interview with Andrew Fong, Vice President of Infrastructure at Dropbox. Previously, Andrew has served as a senior system administrator at a number of technology companies, including YouTube and AOL. On this episode, Andrew talks about how to use data storage to create better workflows, the future of cloud data storage, and much more. So please enjoy this interview with Andrew Fong and your host, Steve Hamm. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about yourself to start. I, I noticed that you've been at Dropbox for about eight years, which is pretty long for a technology comp- startup or a, a Silicon Valley company. So you must like it there. Why have you stayed so long? That is right. I, had, I joined Dropbox in about in 2012. At the time, I think the co- company was about 120, 130 people. I moved over from Google and I have found Dropbox to be this really unique experience of this intersection between technology and people. Mm-hmm. And that has created this really unique culture. For me, that's actually the main driving reason that I've stayed. I would sum it up as when you work in infrastructure like I do, it's very hard to find a scale and a reach in, in, in most companies that, that you're afforded to build on top of. And Dropbox had that. And then we also had this incredibly talented technical set of, of engineers. And that intersection for me really just gelled. And I've just had a fantastic time bouncing around between technology projects along with and working with a set of exceedingly talented engineers. And that, that's yeah. the reason I've stayed. Yeah. You mentioned the culture. What's, what's so unique about it? I find that we really try to put the technical efficacy of projects at a level that really resonates with me. Um, We try to make sure that we make the right technical decisions coupled with the right business decisions. We make sure that we have the right discussions and we have them up front and we're pretty frank about them. And we really try to remove the, you know, all the inherent biases around why you should do something or why you shouldn't do something and look at it from the lens of what's best for Dropbox. And so that that we used to have this value of we, not I, that value really comes through for me. Um, I find that cultural value of like, of just trying to do the right thing overall for the company to be really inspiring. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool, cool. So, you know, the name of this podcast is the rise of the data cloud. And that's obviously our big theme. And yet, you know, I note that in 2015, Dropbox migrated from the public cloud to running its own data centers, kind of the opposite of the trend that we are focused on. And so why did the company do this? And what, and what were the results? You're correct. We did migrate our data, um, our storage platform layer away from the public cloud. I, will, I do want to take a step back and level set with how Dropbox is architected. Okay. Dropbox has two main pieces of content. One is the metadata about files. With This is the access times, the ACLs, the creation time, who owns the file, et cetera, um, the file name, where is it located in the directories, and then also storage content. And from the very beginning, we've always been in a hybrid mode. We've always had our own data centers, our own footprint, as well as leverage public cloud. So we've had that competency and we wanted to build on that competency. And we saw ourselves as a company that was going to be fundamentally powered by data. This is, and at the time, I think we had roughly 600, 700 petabytes of user data in the public cloud. And we said, we need to have control of this data. We need to be able to make and find efficiencies in this data. We need to be able to analyze this data in any way we want to analyze this data. We, want, we really saw data as a core competency that we needed to have as a, as, as a business. And so we, took, we started that journey about migrating out of the public cloud in 2015 for storage. We still do have a footprint in the public cloud for other, for other things, but it, this is primarily around storage. And we just felt it was a really key part of the business and at the scale we were operating at, operating at that we could find those efficiencies. I think that answered the first part of your question. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, let me let me pin that down a little bit. So I want to understand. So you moved. So all the storage, your 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 customers' data, you moved into your own data center. Correct. We moved about six hundred petabytes, seven hundred petabytes. Yeah. At the time. So what's the advantage of moving that into your data center? What what efficiencies or ability to analyze the data do you get out of that? When you think about building a storage system, you have to think about the customers and the use cases that go onto that storage system. And when we designed our storage system called Magic Pocket, I may refer to it as MP, but it's the full name is Magic Pocket. Magic Pocket is designed 
as a purpose-built file system and storage system, block storage system, not file system, block storage system for Dropbox. And what this means is we don't actually support all the APIs that the public cloud was supporting from their block storage system. We built a storage system which was purpose-built for the workload that we had. And when you do that, you can build an end-to-end -end vertically integrated stack. You probably don't want to do that if you have one terabyte of data because you're not going to get any economies of scale. But when you start to look at you know, data sets approaching an exabyte, and we're well over an exabyte of user data at this point, when, when you have data set sizes that large, you actually can build a vertically integrated stack that is much more efficient than a general purpose stack. So think about this as you know, a lot of times in the ML and AI world, you hear people saying, I'm going to use a GPU because it's more efficient. And I'm going to get a better, I'm going to, it's going to be faster. It's going to give me better performance. It's going to be cheaper for, for a number of cycles I need. This is a similar sort of play where we're actually able to do that with storage. Yeah. Okay. So what parts did you leave in the cloud? What parts of your business? What, what data? What data did we leave in the cloud? Things that we've left in the cloud have been international block storage, actually, because as, you, as we were talking about, you have to have this economies of scale. And you do have users and customers that want to have data stored outside of the North, Northern America, which is where our locations are storing data. And so we leverage public cloud in Europe, in um, Tokyo, and in Australia as a way to extend our footprint and allow local data to be, to be stored within country, within region. And that's, we look at that as a feature that we can provide. We built a, a storage system that has an abstraction that allows us to route data blocks anywhere we want. So there's not a, we're not beholden actually to have any single one storage system store these blocks. We can actually store them in our magic pocket system. We can store them in any number of public clouds if we so desired. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's get to uh, um, let's get to Snowflake's technology because um, I know you use it. So if you could explain how do you use it, that'd be great. So if we're thinking about how do we use Snowflake and how do we adopt it, what we look at is we've had a very robust analytics data pipeline. But at the end of the day, you have a, to service the business user as well, not just the engineering footprint user. And what we found Snowflake to be very good for as a use case for us is actually to slice the data and I'll give, the, give interfaces to a, a non-technical set of users. And when I say non-technical set of users, I want a level set that I'm talking about in the engineering team at Dropbox, which is going to be much more accustomed to going in and writing a bunch of code to analyze data and be comfortable with that. And so this is going to be a bridge into the into the general business operations units, into the teams that need to do financial analysis. We need to be able to give them interfaces that allow them to make performant queries, that be able to visualize that data very quickly, and generally give them an experience that's not, uh, that's not what an engineer would have. We need to give an experience that's much more from, you know, a, I would say consumer, but like a true end user. We need to look at it from that perspective. And we really found that Snowflake gave us the ability to do that from, from that perspective. Yeah. Let me see if I understand. So it sounds like you've, you've moved the, your, your customer's data mm -hmm. into your own data centers, but you're using Snowflake for business analytics. Is that a way to put it? Yes. So we use Snowflake for, business, for, for a set of business analytics, and we still have a data lake and a data pipeline that's in our production systems, which runs both on-prem and public cloud, and that all funnels into a centralized public cloud sort of storage system, which then routes some portion of that data into the Snowflake systems. Okay, cool, cool. Now you mentioned engineering, general business, and financial analysis. Can you kind of walk through some of those? How exactly are those functions using the Snowflake technology and, and using analytics based on that technology? The primary use cases for this are going to be routed around understanding where users are in the world, that type of data. It's not going to be cutting sort of the ML and AI side of the, of the analytics, which is going to be much more powered on the production side. So I mean, when, when, when we think about cloud data, we think about some of the sharing capabilities of it, specifically the ability to break through the silos that organizations often have within, you know, within their own structure. Is that something that's useful to you about the cloud data warehouse and the cloud data platform? We definitely have a strategy internally where we want to democratize, democratize the data as much as possible so that we can make high quality business decisions based on data. So I think about this as 
you know, it's a tiered architecture. You must have some repository of all the data. You must govern that data in some way so that some of these metrics are actually going to be certified metrics that we can actually push through pipelines all the way up to the CFO financial dashboards or all the way over to the product teams that need to make very clear cut decisions on whether they should launch a product or not launch a product. And so as you move up or down that hierarchy, you're going to have different types of interfaces that you're going to need to have for different types of users. And so when I think about how we leverage Snowflake, it's going to be much more on the top end of that stack, more on the CFO side. And then as you move down to the product, product analytics, and keep going down the stack, um, you're going to probably shift more into, I would say, a user base that wants to consume a tremendous amount of data that's very unstructured. This could be crash reporting logs, for example, like our analytics pipelines store that type of data as well. It's not just purely a set of business making decisions. It could be, we need to use this data to to analyze crash rates across all of our desktop clients, which number in the hundreds of millions to billions. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And that's unstructured data, right? I mean, you're just putting that in the, in the data lake. It's very unstructured data. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So, um, you know, I, I have a question about your business. I mean, I, I'm a great admirer of Dropbox. Yeah, you know, I also wonder about it because, you know, cloud storage provides tremendous utility for businesses and for individuals that me, but, but on the face of things, it's a commodity business. So how does Dropbox add value and achieve high profit margins, you know, keep it stock up and all that kind of stuff? So from a, if I look at the types of data that we store from a customer perspective, it's just an astronomical amount of data. It's one of the largest repositories of data in the world, most likely from a, from a, from a business and consumer perspective in a unified way. And as customers put more and more data into it, they can build workflows on top of that. They can, and we can enhance the value of that. I would, in a, the simple example I use, my wife is a lawyer. She sends files back and forth all the time for contracts and she redlines them. And then she's always constantly trying to figure out what's the diff of contract A versus contract B. Did I send it to the right person? What if that person's out of the office? How do I get a response from the lawyer at the other company? And so when I think about using Dropbox, right, this provides a workflow that's a, that, we, that can be built on top of that data. So she can look at the diff, she can get the revision history, she can understand who's looked at it, who's modified it, she can look at the commenting history on it, and it's document type agnostic in some sense. It's not just a Word document, she can do this with a PDF. She can look at it on her mobile device, she can look at it on her, on her iPad, she can do it as she's you know, on Muni in San Francisco, and it gives her a way to free herself from the sort of desktop application that was there in the, in the previous world. And so these smart workspaces that we're looking to enable give us a bridge from what was file sync and share and from the very simplistic manner which you're talking about the commodity side much more into a bridge around collaboration where there's another party and it's not just you using your document but it's someone on the other side as well so i i use, like to use that example because i it hits home for me when i watch her and her workflows and she does you know she works at a place that doesn't use dropbox and i constantly tell her you know if you if you had this you, this, your workflow would be much, much better and you'd be able to collaborate with a much wider set of people in a much faster way. So it's an efficiency she would get from her workflow as well. Yeah. So in, in this case, is Dropbox a platform that these other applications are built on top of? Or do you actually build, you know, vertical or horizontal apps into your, plat, you know, into your technology? So we have integrations now at this point within the desktop application service. So we have partnerships with Zoom, for example, where starting a meeting around a document is something that you can that you can do straight from the Dropbox client. You can build other integrations with, other, with some of our other partners. I believe Atlassian is a partner where you can tie in Jira tickets, you can tie in Confluence right back to the content, right? And so now you have this single place where you're in single pane where you can go and you can create workflows as needed, whether, and so you're not having a thousand browser tabs open. I know that's something that I constantly struggle with is I have a million websites open for a million different places, but I still can't find that one piece of information I need. And so from our perspective, if it all starts with content and we have this repository of content and people are working on that and collaborating on it, that should be the focal point and the thing that everything else rotates around. So you've talked about these new capabilities that you build on top of, of your storage capabilities, these, these, truly applications uh, and workflows. And I'm just wondering, have you used data analytics either to help you kind of design or improve those new capabilities? 
I would go as far as to say that every single feature we develop, every single experiment we do is all about using the the analytics pipelines. We want to make thoughtful decisions about what we launch and what we don't launch. And then we also want to use them, you know, if you take it to the logical extreme rate right, the ML and AI side of the world, we want to use that from, for surfacing the better data to our users as well about what they are actually could take advantage of. Um, so in our tray, in the menu bar, populating recent documents around a meeting, for example, you can either do that simple heuristics or you can build some, some more sophisticated ML and AI models around that. So that's like on one extreme of how we're using the data. And then in the middle, there's the generalized We've launched a product and we understand sort of the A-B testing about how is it doing. Was, what, were we seeing more active users being driven from solution A versus solution B? And so we, we take a very rigorous process from that perspective. Very standard sort of industry best practices around the A-B testing and then making sure we're using analytics in the proper way to actually build models around understanding what the users are actually doing and what behaviors they have when they, when they enter the site or they're using our Dropbox clients. 